US Airlines reportedly ran out of red wine and red wine sales began to skyrocket. And for the next month, there was reports that red wine sales in the US spiked by 44%. You referenced earlier how society still believes that a glass of red wine is good for your heart and how preposterous that is based on what we know now. Do you know how all this myth began? I do, and I'm happy to share the story, but do you know where the myth actually originated from? I feel like I, I knew this at one point, but I think I might need a refresher. Yeah. So th the myth is that a glass of wine is good for your heart. And people have been latching onto this since about 1991. And in 1991, what happened was, is that the American TV news show 60 Minutes, they did a piece where they interviewed a French scientist by the name of Serge Renault who became a hero of the wine industry because of this interview. And the 60 Minutes journalist, Morley Safer, a very, very famous 60 Minutes journalist, he's passed now, but very famous at the time. He latched onto this claim from the French scientist and he smiled as he raised a glass of red wine to the 33 million viewers who tuned in to that 60 Minutes episode that night. So essentially, they interviewed this French scientist. They went over to France and the French scientist, who, who ironically or incidentally came from a, a, a vineyard family, came from a wine producing family, was saying, oh, you know, I'm confident that wine is good for the heart. It's good for your heart health. You know, the science is there, which of course it wasn't. But in 91, he was just saying this and 60 Minutes la lapped it up. They loved it. And the day following that 60 Minutes episode, US airlines reportedly ran out of red wine and red wine sales began to skyrocket. And for the next month, there was reports that red wine sales in the US spiked by 44%. That's two and a half million additional bottles of red wine that were sold in the month after that 60 Minutes story. Now, to be clear, in 1991, wow. the crazy. internet wasn't really a, a, a big thing right? Like, yeah. in fact, I don't even think it was a thing in 91, or if it was, it was just this cute little idea. So people tuned in to television at that stage. And, and 60 Minutes was like a god of television news shows. 33 million people is a lot of people. And they re-aired the same episode a year later in 1992. And the same thing happened. The sales spiked again, but this time by 49%. And sales of red wine for the entire year from when the episode first aired to when they re-aired it a year later were up by 39%. And Americans never looked back. They devoured red wine as if it was protecting them from death and somehow improving their health. Now, there was just one big problem, though. The claims that alcohol was good for health have now been shown to be completely and utterly false, like completely and utterly false. That's how it started. And I get it. People love the idea. I mean, who wouldn't love the idea? Oh, I can have guilt-free wine. I can drink booze guilt-free and it's good for me. No problems. Let me have it. Yeah. But it's just it's plain trending. not true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's crazy too, right? Because I think maybe it was that scientist that was talking about that, but the latched on to the polyphenol of reservatol, which provides antioxidants into the wine, right? And so not once did they actually take a look at alcohol, right? And what that impact is having on it. And so it's funny because when I talk about non-alcoholic red wine, you're actually still getting the antioxidants now from that reservatol without the effects of alcohol. Um, so in its innateness, yes, the antioxidants are good for you, but it's so easy to see, you know, I mean, you saw this too with, with some of, you know, in dairy and with fat and how sugar, right? Like all of those big industries tailored some sort of messaging for you to believe that it was actually having a positive impact on you. And when the real data comes through, it's, it's hard for people to start to rewire their brain of how they've been thinking maybe for years that this was good for you. And I even had an occasion with my uncle who, yeah, his whole life, he was told that, you know, 15 beers a week is that's fine for the male, the average male. Right. So that's, you know, maybe two a day. And all of a sudden he got this data that like, no, the government's saying that's not good. And it was a shock to him. He was like, he didn't think it was that bad because the government said, hey, you know, yeah, we can say two drinks a day is fine. 
And so he, at that moment, decided to, okay, I'm not drinking anymore. Um, and I think there was a lot of Canadians that were just so shocked by this news. And to me, it was shocking that there was no insight into it, right? That no one actually had the awareness about it. So I think sometimes, you know, maybe James, you and I are in our own bubbles where we talk a lot about the non-alcoholic industry and a lot of people that we are with don't really drink so much anymore. And as at a big scale, there's still a lot of education that needs to happen around this, right? There's so much education. I mean, but I would also submit that the reason why Groovy is so popular and so successful and why there are such a plethora of alcohol-free alternatives on the market now is because of increased education. I mean, now that we have the internet, there's plenty of health educators who are all over Instagram and TikTok. I mean, some of them I would submit are, are not great, <laughs> and but... The majority, like now we have access to education. We've got chat GPT, we've got the internet, we can Google these things as long as we're we're getting our information from thorough resources and proven resources, then that's great. So I, I mean, certainly all the evidence seems to suggest that younger people, because of what I submit is increased education around the dangers of alcohol, are actually turning their back on alcohol. Like they've never drunk less. Is that what you you're experiencing and seeing? Yeah. I mean, I think Gen Z is leading a lot in yeah, being the first generation to drink less than any other generation or not drink at all right off the bat. Right. It's I think there used to be this open the floodgates and it's like I'm allowed to drink now and go all in. And, and they've already had kind of this awareness about the impact of alcohol before jumping and maybe seen the impacts of alcohol within you know their families. And I think also this awareness around, yeah, what are you consuming? What are you putting in your body? Your mental health, I think, is a big piece. Um, you know, my background in studying neuroscience and understanding somewhat that impact on alcohol and how that can really create a deeper loop for depression and anxiety. And so understanding how we can break that a little bit. But I think ultimately people still want to have this, the occasions. They still want to have those celebratory moments. They still want to, you know, indulge in all that life has to offer. It's just alcohol is not really invited to that party anymore. 